We give God some praise for our family and friends in India who are, man, just some amazing, amazing things. Uh, if you, um, man, one of the, there, there's a lot that I could say about the 10 days that we spent uh, in India, but one of the things that I thought was most uh, amazing was last Sunday as I got up, uh, or right before I got up to preach, I just looked at the room, and it was about the size of this room. It wasn't much bigger than this, um, but it was full. Uh, standing room only. Everyone was sitting shoulder to shoulder. I mean, it was, it was jam-packed, um, and uh, at the end, the pastor said, uh, pray for more space. <laughs> pray for a bigger space, because we got more people, and, uh, and I just I thought it was amazing. And, uh, but one of, the, one of the things, standing room only, but down front, right in front of where I got up to speak, was just a group of about 30 students and, and children, and they were just singing along with every song. They didn't need a song book. They didn't need words on a screen. They knew the songs that they were singing, and they were clapping, and they were having a blast, and man, just the formation that was taking Taking place and the young people's lives over there was just incredible and inspiring to see and uh, and man I just there, there's a there's a part of me that's like man I I want more of that you know I want more of that that's pretty awesome so if you want to know more about the trip feel, please feel free to pull me aside uh, Chris and Brianna are here raise your hands Chris and Brianna they were on the trip Lynn and Wydell are here right behind Chris and Brianna raise your hands guys uh, if you want to know more about the trip all of us were on the trip together as well as uh, Ben uh, Johnson who was in first service we'd love to talk to you more about it it was just a blast and uh, and hopefully there will be more opportunities for more of you guys to come with us next time we go amen yeah, you guys are like, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know, Derek, uh, I, tr I promise you it's worth it, all right, I promise you it's worth it, all right, hey, if you have your Bible, uh, open it up to Hosea chapter 11, uh, Hosea chapter 11, if you don't know uh, how to find Hosea, you can open to the middle of your Bible, uh, and then flip a few pages back toward the back of your Bible, and you'll run into Hosea before you get to the New Testament, if you get to the New Testament, you've gone too far, uh, if you get to Daniel, you're almost there, Hosea is the book right after Daniel. Uh, so uh, feel free to, uh, to, to flip over there. But while we go over there, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the book of Hosea, because my guess is most of you haven't spent a decade reading it and studying it, all right? Uh, so uh, so here's, the, here's the idea. The book of Hosea is, uh, is predominantly poetry, uh, and that's a good thing to know uh, when you're getting ready to read a book, because it means it's not going to be written in a form of which can easily be understood. Uh, so much of the Old Testament is written in poetry. One third of the Old Testament Bible is written in uh, is written in poetry, uh, which means we should really pay attention and we should really think about that uh, as we start to read. And when we just jump in and don't pay attention to the fact, like, oh, this is poetry. Uh, that's why it seems so strange to me. Like, that, I, okay, just, just that's that's why it seems so strange. All right, but um, but it, it means that we should study it because it's one third of what God's trying to communicate to us. Uh, we don't want to miss that <laughs> one third just because it's hard to understand. Uh, so uh, one. The, the, as, as, the, as the book of Hosea is broken up, it's broken up into three sections. The first section is chapters one through three. Uh, and it's a story uh, in poetry form about Hosea and this woman named Gomer. And Gomer is Hosea's wife, and Gomer continually is adulterous. She goes out and she cheats on Hosea, and God tells Hosea, go bring her back. And she cheats on Hosea again, and God says, go bring her back. And she cheats on Hosea again, and God says, go bring her back. Every time. And he's, it's just this, this kind of revolving cycle. And this story is supposed to mimic Israel's relationship with God. Uh, that God is a loving husband, so to speak, and he has loved and cared for Israel in only the way that God can love and care for someone, and, uh, and, and yet Israel has turned away, and they've worshipped other gods, and they've turned aside to other nations to find prosperity, and to find hope, and to find all the things that they're looking for instead of looking to God for those things, and so there, the, Israel is this adulterous bride. Uh, and so uh, that's the beginning. And then chapters 4 through 11 is the second section. We're going to look at chapter 11. 
But in chapters 4 through 10, it's largely a poetic complaint uh, of God. And it's God complaining that the people of Israel do not know him or do not have knowledge of him. Now, in uh, the scriptures, we should know that the idea of knowledge is not head knowledge. It is not uh, facts and details. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for to know or knowledge in Hebrew is the word yada. I think I've talked to you guys about this word in the past, but we'll do a re refresher. Uh, the idea behind yada is not uh, to, to have a, uh, an understanding of facts and details. It's to experientially know someone through relationship. Uh, so, so this is the primary form of knowledge in which God is calling his people to within the scriptures and within the Bible is to know him through a relationship, not just facts and details about him. Now, I'm a huge sports fan. I love sports. And one of my uh, favorite teams of all time is the Buffalo Bills. Um, and one of my, and so I can, I can tell you all kinds. I have a Buffalo Bills trivia book at home and I can answer almost every single one of the facts in there, and if you ask me certain questions about certain players and certain stats from certain years, I'll be able to give you all of those things, right? Like, you start talking to me about Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas, I'm going to be able to throw down. You know what I'm saying? I know some stuff about Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas. However, I don't know Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas. You know what I'm saying? So I know a lot of stuff about those guys, but I don't know anything, I don't know them personally. And my knowledge of them has nothing to do with the relational experience that I've had with them, okay? And this is the, the idea behind what's happening is that it seems Israel intellectually understands and knows who God is and what God is about, but they don't necessarily know him. And Jesus says something about this in, in Matthew chapter 7 in Sermon on the Mount. He says that many of you will come to me and say, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do this in your name? And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Because you can do a lot of stuff and yet not have the experiential relationship with Jesus or with God that he desires us to have. That's why at our church we don't start with, hey, do a bunch of stuff. We start with be with Jesus. <laughs> then become like him and then do what he did. Okay? Because we want to make sure we get that right. That we know him, not just by facts and details, but that we know him experientially and relationally as one who knows a friend. And so out of that, you have this idea of this adulterous people who continually turn away from God and a people who, although they know a lot about God, don't know God, comes chapter 11. And it's one of the most beautiful chapters, I think, in all the Bible. Um, it says this in verse 1. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a child to the cheek. And I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt? And will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities, and I will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God Most High. I will by no means exalt them. How can I give up Ephraim? How can I hand over Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? And how can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord, and he will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. 
They will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows, from Assyria fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. Now, <clears throat> that's the, the whole chapter of chapter 11. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. Um, and it's, it's a poem about a father who loves his child. And a father who, in the love of his child, um, he, he takes him by the hand and he walks with him. And shows him how to take steps, right? You guys know that, right? You guys can understand that if you have children. You, you take the child by the hands and you kind of walk with them as they walk. And you show them how and the ways in which they're supposed to go. And the directions in which they're supposed to go. And all that kind of stuff. And it's just a, it's a beautiful picture of a loving uh, father. A father who lifts up a child and puts the child next to his cheek. To show affection and care and love and that he's there for them. A, a, a father who bends down and gets on their level and looks them eye in the eye and offers them something to eat. It's this beautiful, beautiful picture of a loving father. And it's also a really devastating picture of a son who wants nothing to do with this loving father. Who, although this father has loved him and shown him the ways in which he should walk and the ways in which he should go, has gone away to places like Egypt in order to find uh, prosperity, in order to, to bolster his name. He's gone uh, and, and is going to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians uh, because he would, and, and he's going to look to them for prosperity and safety and refuge instead of this loving father's hand. And it's really, really sad. And in this poem, you see God, and he's conflicted. He's, he's depicted with this, this idea of having a conflicted heart, one that's got this anger due to Israel's rebellion, but also sadness due to Israel's rebellion, and also compassion due to Israel's rebellion. It's a really fascinating thing when you think about it. You think about God, and you think, oh, wow, he's all of these things, and he expresses all of these emotions. If you're thinking, uh, I know many people think that emotions are bad and emotions are evil. Can I just tell you they're not? They're actually a part of who we are that bears the image of our creator, that he also had emotions. Jesus showed emotions. Jesus wept. He was sad. He was angry. He flipped over some tables. He also showed compassion and love and kindness to those uh, in and around him. He, he showed emotion. So when we have emotions... Not a bad thing. It's a part of who we are created to be, and it's just a source of information of what's going on in our life um, that we should pay attention to. Now, if you um, begin to grab a hold of what's talked about here at the end of this, it, it's although God is sad and although God is angry, he says, I'm not going to execute my fierce anger. That I'm... Uh, that in his heart, which David talked about last week, right, the motivation of, uh, of our life and the motivation of who we are comes from deep within our heart, right? And it says here that within God's heart, it's changed and all his compassion is aroused. And so this, this chapter is really a glimpse at what this whole book of Hosea is all about. The book of Hosea is all about this adulterous, rebellious Israel that continually turns away and is led into sin, and they're going to be punished, and there's going to be consequences for their sin. However, God's love and mercy is always more powerful than their sin. That's the theme of this book. The theme of this book is that God's love and his mercy are always more powerful than the sin that is committed by his people. But this can lead us to two responses. This can lead us to two responses. Um, one is resentfulness. Let me explain what I mean by that, okay? In Exodus chapter 32, Moses comes down from this mountain after spending time with God for 40 days and 40 nights. 
and, uh, and God has given him the law, and he's given him the Ten Commandments and all the stuff, and he's coming down the mountain. And uh, as he's coming down the mountain, he hears this party going on. And he's like, oh, we must have gone into battle in the last 40 days and won this great battle. And, like, there are people dancing and singing and cheering and clapping. They're doing all the stuff, and it, they're all excited. And he's coming down the mountain, and he sees that, no, what they're actually doing is they're worshiping a golden calf that they've made. Like he's been gone for him for a month and 10 days. If I left you guys for a month and 10 days, would y'all go worship another God? I don't know, right? Like it, it's like, how, how dumb can they be, right? I mean, God has, just, God has just led them out of slavery, out of captivity into this great place where he wants to be their people. And he's trying to make a covenant with them. He's trying to make a promise with them. He's trying to be their God and call them to be his people. And they're worshiping a golden calf. And so God, like, he's furious. Moses is mad, but God is furious. God wants to wipe them out. He actually begins to enact a plan, and on the first day, 3,000 men die on the first day. And then Moses goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> we can't do this. This is, no, no we, can't, we can't let everybody die. God, you can't kill everybody. You can't just wipe us out. And so he goes to God, and he begins to say, God, forgive them for their sins. That's the words that he uses. He says, forgive them for their sins. And God does. God forgives them. And he tells Moses, he goes, now take them where I told you to go. And Moses is like, I'd love to, but I don't know where that is. <laughs> and, um, and so chapter 33 of Exodus is, is Moses going into the tent of meeting and talking to God like one talks to a friend and, and essentially getting to this place of where he says, okay, God, I need you to do me a favor. You gotta show me your glory. You gotta show me your glory so that I know that you're gonna go with me. I don't wanna go if you're not going with me. I don't wanna go anywhere that you're not going ahead of me. And so God says, well, I can't show you my face, but here's what I'll do. I'll put you in a cleft of a rock and I'll pass you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over your face and then I'll take my hand away and let you see my backside. And, uh, and Moses is like, all right, that's good enough. And so, so they, they do the thing, and Moses gets in the cleft of the rock, and God comes by and puts his hand over Moses and then lifts his hand, and, and Moses gets to see God's backside. And God says this as he's passing by Moses. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, I am a God that is compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness to thousands. And I forgive the iniquity and sin and rebellion and wickedness of generations. God passes Moses, and what he describes himself as is a God who is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's his description of himself. Why does that make me mad? Can I just be honest? Because Israel deserves to die. I don't know if you guys have as big of a problem with it as I do, but I got a problem with it. I'm like, come on, man. Like, they don't deserve you. Right? Anyone else? Anyone else look at a family member who's crazy and does dumb stuff all the time and be like, they don't deserve your love, God. So we can respond to this compassionate, loving God and the way that he is compassionate and the way he is loving, and we can do it with a lot of resentfulness. You know, this, this description of God that's found in Exodus 34, it's actually the main way in which God is described all throughout the Old Testament from that point forward. Throughout the Psalms, throughout Proverbs, throughout all the prophets, this, this, this exact phrase comes up again and again and again and again and again. You want to know one of my favorite places that it shows up is when it shows up at the end of the book of Jonah. You guys know Jonah? Jonah. <laughs> 
So Jonah is this hotshot prophet, um, and, uh, and God says, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to ask these people to repent, and Jonah's like, I would rather die, literally. Uh, I would rather not do that. And so he, he says, no, God, I'm not going to do that, and he gets on a boat, and he heads off in the opposite direction of Nineveh, and the seas get crazy, and everybody starts to freak out, and he's like, guys, it's my fault. Just throw me overboard. So they throw him overboard, and this big fish comes and swallows Jonah, you know? Jonah's in the belly of this fish and he cries out to God. He cries out to God after being in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights and, and, and he says, God rescue me from the pit of Sheol. Sheol is a Hebrew word for grave. He says, pull me out of the grave. And so God pulls him out of the grave and the fish vomits Jonah back out onto the dry land and Jonah goes to Nineveh and he tells Nineveh um, to repent and turn to God and they do. And that's where every children's book Bible story ends and it comes to Jonah. <laughs> but there's one more chapter in the book of Jonah and, and it's where Jonah sits up on a hill and is angry because God let them repent. And Jonah says these words to God. He says, he says you know, God, I, I'd rather die right now because I never wanted to come here to begin with. I didn't want to come to Nineveh and I didn't want to ask these people to repent because I knew that you were a God who was compassionate and slow to anger, loyal in love, and you are faithful. I didn't want to come here because I knew that's who you were and you would let them repent. You would let them be forgiven. So I didn't want to give them forgiveness. So that's one way we can respond to this loyal love of God, this compassion that he has for his people and the nations. But then there's also another way in which we can respond. And I think, um, I want to go to, to uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 to kind of talk about this idea. Second Peter chapter 3, Peter is writing, and he has this great ending to this book, uh, but he says this in verse 8, he says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. What, um, what Peter is talking about, he's talking about the day of the Lord when God returns, when Jesus comes back, and he's saying, don't think that he is being slow in coming and returning. I know he said he's going to come back. Don't think that that's being done slowly, um, because he can't think of his slowness in the same terms as you understand slowness. But he says this, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire on the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. So <clears throat> the other response that we can have to God's loyal love and his compassion and his willingness to be slow to anger um, is we can repent. We can turn back to God. That's what it means. The fact that he hasn't returned yet means that we have yet another day to turn back to God. We have a yet another day to repent and turn in his direction. The fact that he has not come back means that he is still being gracious and compassionate and, and showing loyal love, offering anyone and everyone who would want to come and be with him an opportunity to repent and come and be with him. He's giving that opportunity over, and so we can respond with resentfulness or we can respond with repentance, and we can, and we can come into this place of where we begin to walk with this loving Father who takes us by the hand and shows us his immense love. And you may think, well, if I have today, I'll probably have tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe. But Peter says it will also come like a thief. 
meaning it could come anytime, and you're not going to know it, and you're not going to expect it, and so you might as well repent the moment that you know that you need to. <laughs> don't hesitate, and don't wait, but turn your life toward God because he's giving you a chance to do so. It's this beautiful, beautiful invitation. But there will come a day where he roars. That's what it says here in Peter, but it also says it in Hosea 11. So he's going to roar like a lion. And he's going to bring his people from the west. He's going to bring them home from these places that they've gone to worship other gods. He's going to roar and he's going to bring them back and give them a place to live and call their home. And so here's, here's kind of the, the way I, I think we should land the plane because what God is, or what we're experiencing is, is the fact that we have a Savior whose heart is bent on not seeing us perish right but giving us an opportunity for repentance isn't that a part of the most famous bible verse in the world john 3:16 for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for he did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through jesus christ he didn't come here to condemn us. He came here to save us. He didn't come here um, to show us all of the bad things that we've done wrong and, and then say, you're a lost cause. He came here to say, you're a lost cause, but I love you anyway. And I'm going to die for you even though you're a lost cause. I'm going to love you so much that even while you're still sinners, I will die for you. And so you and I, we have a choice. We have a choice. We have a choice to make. We can, we can either be like Jonah, who was rescued out of the grave and yet when other people were extended that same love and that same kindness and that same mercy and that same faithfulness of God, we become resentful. Or we can be like so many great saints before us who realize that Jesus has rescued us out of the grave and given us an opportunity at having new life and to share that love and that compassion and that mercy with others even though man it's really hard isn't it see the invitation is is that we can come home to the father's love and we can extend this compassion and love and faithfulness that we've been given to others we come home to the Father's love. Some, some of you, um, maybe you think that your sin keeps you from the grace of God, that your sin is too great. The book of Hosea says that <laughs> your sin is great, but his grace is greater. And so you, uh, what happens a lot of times is when we make a mistake or when we sin or when we fail or when we, when we don't do it right, we get, we get kind of enamored with the, the, the fact that we failed and we, we turn and we actually run away from God. That's what sin does to us a lot of times. But what sin does to, to, to God is it actually brings this, him closer to us. I mean, Jesus came to us. He didn't, he didn't run away. He came as close as he could get. He came in the flesh to say, come home. 
to the Father's love. Stop running. Stop running. I love you. I want to save you. I don't want to condemn you. So come home to the Father's love. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never chosen to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to him. Maybe you've never been baptized or said, I believe and I want to be saved. We want to give you that chance. You have that chance to repent because he still hasn't come back yet. But then there's also those of us that we have a choice and we can respond and, and, and we've already said yes to Jesus. We've accepted his love and his grace and we're all about that for ourselves but sometimes it's hard for us to extend that to others when they need it and, and we have an opportunity to, to just embrace the invitation that his love gives to us that we can extend that now to the world around us, to those in our sphere of influences at our workplaces and in our neighborhoods and in our families that we can be a source of his loving kindness and compassion and faithfulness to those nearby. I hope that, uh, I hope that you know um, the truth that is found in the scriptures that he is for you. And if he is for you, then who can be against you? Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just the chance we have to be here and to uh, give you praise. God, thank you for the book of Hosea. Uh, thank you for being a God who is compassionate, who is slow to anger, who abounds with a steadfast and loyal love and never runs out and never runs the other direction but it's always there thank you for your faithfulness to us and to your people for generations for we don't deserve it we haven't earned it but you offer it to us anyway God, we we come before you and God, if we have been guilty of sin, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for the realization that our sin is not a qualifier to now run from you but it's actually a qualifier to run toward you because it is our sin that brought you to earth to die for us and to save us and so may we come home to your love today may we hold dear to your love today May we offer that love to the world as a display that we are your sons and your daughters bought by your blood. We love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.